Hello and welcome to Oxford University Linguistic Society's fourth event for Trinity Term uh, 2021. We're here with Professor Hagit Borea at the uh, Queen Mary University of London, who works in comparative syntax, morphosyntax and language acquisition, all of which we hope to touch on a bit here. Uh, Professor Borea, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. So if we start um, broadly with the morphosyntax interface, um, what is the, the lexicon and how's the distinction been drawn between the syntax and the lexicon historically? Uh, yeah, I think it, that starting from a historical context is a good idea. Uh, within generative grammar, lexicon actually uh, came in not at the very beginning. It, uh, it started being elaborated on uh, in the mid 60s, uh, especially with the uh, Chomsky's aspects of the theory of uh, syntax. And uh, uh, beginning more or less in 1965 and through a number of uh, important turning points that, that, that um, appealing to information that's stored in the lexicon has become more and more central within the linguistic theory in let's say the subsequent 30 years. Uh, and uh, it got to a point where uh, um, uh, you, you could differentiate between number of, uh, of models that were out there. I, I much prefer the term model to the term theory sometimes. The stages of these things as an independent theory is not 100% clear, but at any rate models. And that those models uh, were to a, a lesser or greater extent counting on, on uh, information that is stored uh, 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 items specifically. Uh, and you went all the way from theories that uh, were building their entire uh, syntax and eventually uh, formal semantics from uh, information that's stored in lexical entry to theories that were doing it to a lesser extent. But uh, uh, the, the appeal to, to lexical information was really quite massive. So if you took uh, a very simple example, a verb like kick, uh, the idea was that the information that's stored with kick uh, will give you, uh, first of all, of course, it's pronunciation and some kind of meaning, whatever. Uh, uh, the meaning of kick might be, and would also give you an awful lot of things that would be a set of instructions on how to fit it into the syntax. And specifically, it would tell you, depending on model, that it, um, uh, it is subcategorized for a direct object, or that it is uh, that it has two theta roles, uh, let's say one associated with an agent or a kicker, and one associated with uh, whatever it is that got kicked. Let's say the ball, and uh, and that these would not just come uh, with uh, the, their semantic importance, but also with information that that would be uh, more general than just uh, uh, regarding kick about where to put them in the syntax. So an agent would have to be in a particular position. A patient would have to be in a. a other position and so kick uh, as it sits in in the lexicon is really a mini syntactic fragment it's not just uh, uh, a word or it's not just a meaning it's 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 a syntactic fragment and depending on how you do your semantics the semantics uh, either dictates that that this is what the syntax is or alternatively you build it uh, on the basis of this information um, and uh, that's, uh, that also led eventually, and because this is, uh, if one thinks about this, the inevitable conclusion to, to, to a situation where the, and not just the, the properties of individual words were stored lexically, but also relationship between words were stored lexically. So if you have a, a relationship between, let's say, uh, um, destroy it, <clears throat> destroy and destruction or, or defer and deferral or, or uh, walk and walker and so on. This was also something that was handled through the lexicon. And the rationale was very much based on uh, the original uh, rationale as it was laid out both in aspects and also subsequent to that in remarks of nominalization, which is a 1970 article by Chomsky. And the, the, the rationale was that um, uh, the syntax is uh, a blind to the properties of individual items. It should be possible to state the syntax as pure computational uh, uh, 
uh, processes. I mean, this is a bit of an anachronism because the word computational kind of came into the metaphoric inventory a bit later, but, uh, but how we would think about it today is the idea was that the syntax is, is purely computational and it should not be able to avail itself of item specific information. And so anything that was um, in some sense an exception, anything that had to be stated as associated with one word, but not with another, it had to go in the lexicon. And then the theoretical logic dictated that if you already had such a rich uh, 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 ability to search the lexicon for a particular property, uh, a lot of the syntax became redundant because mm -hmm. you were just doing something the second time around. And so for instance, uh, um, I, uh, you, you can tell me if you want me to sort of talk with a little bit less detail, but if you talk about, for instance, uh, passive, and so um, if you look at, at theories of the passive within government and binding, which was not the most lexicalist, but was also quite lexicalist. So if you look at government and binding and you look at uh, early accounts of passive, you see that people typically assume that uh, uh, there is movement. So the object in the passive moves to the subject position. Okay? But at the same time, these theories also assume that in the case of, let's say, adjectival passive, or sometimes it's called stative passive, uh, there is also a displacement of the object, but the displacement of the object is lexical. And the reason for this is because passive in English, the verbal passive in English is much more general and exceptionless. I mean, it has exceptions, but they're rare. But adjectival passive is governed by a variety of um, um, more, let's say, item, item specific generalizations. And so that means that in order to do adjectival passive, you had to allow a lexical rule that would take an object and would map it into uh, something that in the syntax would be uh, um, uh, projected as a subject and not as an object. And of course, the immediate question is, why won't you just do it in verbal passive as well? So, so, so of course, you're seeing the divide between, let's say, LFG and, uh, and what uh, 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 GB was doing and eventually minimalism. And in that particular kind of debate in actuality, it was LFG that was using the more principled approach. They said, if you're already mapping uh, internal argument to external arguments, then, then fine, let's, let's just uh, go with it and do it again. Okay. And uh, so that's kind of, I'm giving you very, very broad picture of more or less the 80s. Uh, but then uh, beginning, I would say sometime in the 90s and increasingly so, you're seeing within what was at the time, let's say GB, uh, people are becoming uh, more sensitive to the fact that, uh, that the system is so redundant. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, uh, in the case of, case of passive remains an interesting case because we have pretty good empirical reasons to think that what is going on in adjectival passive and what is going on in verbal passive is not the same thing. And these are things that, for instance, LFG had a hard time capturing with, uh, capturing. So you had the situation where LFG had uh, the cleaner model, but the, but the evidence pointed in a, in a different direction. So what do you do? I mean, the thing is you, uh, the obvious thing to, to do next is to come up with something which is a cleaner model and we, we, which could still handle the facts or at least so we hope. And so you're seeing um, uh, the opposite move. Instead of pushing everything into the lexicon, you're seeing people pushing as much as possible things into the syntax and um, in particular, you're also seeing a reevaluation of what it counts to be an exception. So it remains the fact that language has exceptions and it remains the fact that exceptions are item specific. If, uh, for instance, um, uh, I pronounce the past tense of the verb uh, go as went, or if I pronounce the past tense of the verb dive as dove, but I pronounce the past tense of the verb walk as walked, this is it's, it's an exception, it has to be listed somewhere. But the question is whether the status of this relationship is an exception, whether this is a syntactic fact. And so what you're seeing, uh, a lot of it beginning, I mean, these are tendencies that had, have existed uh, before, so it wasn't new, but you see this all coming together around the claim that there is a way to, to reintroduce into the syntax a lot of the things which, um, 
uh, Chomsky and then subsequently also Halle in 1973 pushed into the lexicon by virtue of being especially phonological exceptions to say, okay, fine, you know, we will do what's called late insertion. So we will do the syntax without taking this into account or suspending all of this. And then we will access the phonologically exceptional information at a later stage. So that means you still have a list. You still need to go and look up uh, um, uh, what the past tense of, of run is, okay? But, uh, but, but you're not allowing this to impact your syntax. You've created uh, an in-principle distinction. Uh, the next step uh, to which I'm at least partially responsible is that saying that it is not just uh, uh, the, phonolo the phonology of lexical items that, that, that you're allowed to access at some later point. It's also the meaning of lexical items that you are allowed to access at some lexical point. And that also builds on a variety of theories and, and, and proposals that were around uh, that, that proposed that, that the relationship between meaning and, um, and, and words is, not, is certainly not wholly bottom up and maybe largely not bottom up. So it's not really, uh, um, uh, that a verb such as kick uh, means what it means because it has a whole set of properties, but really it's the event of kicking that has some syntactic properties in a particular context. And that would give, uh, uh, I mean, kick would have some basic meaning, but it wouldn't be associated with the nuances that come with particular argument structure and so on. And also in the case of uh, English kick and in case of English vocabulary, um, uh, monomorphemic vocabulary especially, it's very easy to see that it's also categorical information. So, so when you're looking at something like kick, kick can also be a noun. Uh, and uh, uh, what would determine according to this particular uh, uh, way of looking at things, what would determine whether kick would be a noun or a verb wouldn't be that we listed it both as a noun or a verb, or that we had maybe a rule that, that created a noun from the verb or the other way around. But, uh, uh, but really you would take kick, which would be just something, okay? I mean, how, how much there is to that something is still debated, but, but uh, it certainly wouldn't be either a noun or a verb, and it wouldn't be necessarily in and of itself associated with any arguments and so on. And, uh, you would build a certain kind of structure around it. I mean, kick has a meaning. It would still uh, be the case that kick would be different from kiss. There, that would be true in, in everybody's use of language that, 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 that words have a, a conventionalized meaning, although the meaning is quite malleable. So that's, uh, when you look at morphosyntax, um, maybe may narrowly defined, what you're looking at is an, at an attempt to uh, challenge the, the, the division between the lexicon and the syntax that comes to us, let's say from the eighties, which was really quite strict and very, uh, very legislated. So in, in the eighties, for instance, when you look at, uh, at work such as uh, Steve LaPointe's work, or when you look at uh, work such as um, uh, the Shula and Williams, you're seeing a, a barrier. There is a barrier. There's something called, for instance, uh, uh, um, the Shula and Williams called it atomicity. And it's, it's, it's a wall, you're not, the syntax is not allowed to see the, 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 the inside of words and the words are not allowed to, to have properties except properties that are associated with the entire word of impacting the syntax. And, and we are trying to, we've been knocking down that wall. And uh, I mean, when you look around, I mean, uh, there's, there's my approach, which is perhaps more radical than some, but, but when you look around, you see people uh, working with uh, that particular war um, being decimated to various degrees, some people more, some people less. And, and, and it's a challenge. Uh, part of the reason that it is a challenge is because work on the lexicon, especially in the 90s, 80s and 90s, um, it's revealed a lot of really, really important generalizations about argument structure and, and to say, okay, fine, this is not really a property of a particular verb. It's a property of some structure. Uh, it's not, uh, it, it's a challenge. It, it's an ongoing challenge to, to, to model argument structure syntactically in such a way that you would be able to capture the, the richness of, uh, of the possibilities out there.
So, um, wh what are the the atoms of syntactic computation under this sort of view? Then, if they're not sort of full words. Okay. So, so for me, I'm I'm, I'm talking about for me. It's not that um, I mean some of aspects of what I say are are more or less standard. So, so some of it is completely standard, and some of it is less standard. So, I'm assuming that the model that the uh, atoms of the um, of the uh, syntactic computations are basically their features uh, uh, or, or features as they're mostly. Uh, realized through the functional vocabulary. So, so uh, uh, I mean, this is an idea that I had, I don't know, in 1980, and, and at the time I did the tools to really fully execute it were not around. And uh, now the, the idea has kind of exploded and it's still very difficult to work with because there isn't an agreed upon inventory of features. But, but, uh, um, but if you do assume that there is a given inventory of features that UG makes available, and if we assume that it's, um, it's the limited, uh, I mean, a separate question is whether um, all of it is available in any given grammar or not, but that's a separate question. Maybe we can agree that it's, I don't know, 50 features, I'm, I'm, I'm just throwing a number. Uh, and that these features uh, have, uh, do ha are grammatical, uh, grammatical functors. They're, 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 there's little operators and each one of them does in fact have properties that um, we use to associate with lexical items. So they are in fact, um, uh, lexical items in the sense that they have properties and those properties are, uh, are syntactic. And uh, it is to be hoped, although this is uh, more or less successful, that those, that inventory of properties is informed at least to some extent by, by formal semantics. And uh, so that is, uh, at, at least for me, there is, a, uh, I mean, and, and again, I mean, you, you see some people who claim, who would like to say that, that that whatever problems there are with assuming that kick has lexical properties, that they're equally associated with saying that diff has lexical properties. Okay, so so and 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 and, and people who subscribe to that view tend to go towards um, a construction grammar in the more traditional sense, where the properties are uh, altogether really associated just with the configuration and the items within it play a, a minimal role. And then you have, of course, the lexicalist approach where something like uh, kick and the have exactly uh, the same ontological status in terms of uh, how much they can or cannot inform the grammar. And then you have the intermediate position, which I think is one way or another, uh, various guises. Um, uh, it's, it's becoming the mainstream minimalist position, if you wish, though I don't want to speak for anybody. Uh, according to which uh, uh, the bulk of the computational properties are carried by things which in and of themselves don't have a conceptual meaning. I mean, of course they have semantics. I mean, the definite article has a lot of semantics, but it's not, um, it's not uh, world knowledge slash conceptual meaning. So that's my, my view. My view is that given a particular inventory of features, uh, which depending on the language and depending on, on the relationship between the syntax and the phonology are realized uh, perhaps differently in different languages and so on, but which have uh, uh, fixed properties and which also have, um, however we, we choose to derive it, which at this point, unfortunately we can't uh, uh, have come in a particular hierarchical order. So, so that's what you have. These are the building blocks of the syntax for me, these are the, the formal properties of um, functional terminals, presumably features, maybe sometimes clusters of features, and, uh, and certain uh, guidelines about uh, how to build hierarchy, merge, and, uh, um, and also a certain inbuilt order, which uh, unfortunate, I mean, it would be really nice to derive. I don't know of anybody who's, I mean, mostly you have people saying, okay, fine, you know, we can't derive this, unfortunately. So, but we have a lot of empirical reasons to assume that that's the order. But I mean, why is aspect below tense and not the other way around, for instance? Yeah. yeah. Um, what does this mean for compositionality? Um, because sort of the words often have, have meanings that are non-compositional, whereas sentences 
Okay, so, so th there is a claim that's built into this. The claim that's built into it is that there, that there aren't just uh, 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 two types of, of vocabulary lists. So you have one vocabulary list with formal features and you have another vocabulary list with things that have conceptual meaning. Okay. So uh, it, it, it doesn't just mean that there are two lists, it also means that there are two kinds of meaning. And, and on that, you see a lot of debate. So I have my perspective and my perspective, uh, it's certainly out there, but I, I wouldn't say it's generally endorsed. Some people have endorsed it. Some people maybe have a harder time endorsing it. And my position is that uh, conceptual meaning is not part of grammar. Of course, it's part of language in the sense that, you know, I couldn't uh, make myself understood if, if the sentences that I uttered did not, were not populated with some conceptual items so that, that, that you would be able to understand it. But that, um, uh, that the only aspect that, that, that is grammatical about these items, in fact, is the mapping to phonology. So uh, uh, yes, I mean, it's not, if, if I uttered a sentence in which uh, all, all conceptual content would be blank, okay, that wouldn't be natural language. And if I uttered a, a sentence in which all conceptual content would be nonsense, that would actually be language. We have this, we have Jabberwocky, and this is an experiment that Lewis Carroll ran in the 19th century because he was already fully tuned to, to, to the fact that the meaning of uh, conceptual items is, is, is an issue in grammar. It's not the self-evident status. Uh, and what is is interesting about Jabberwocky is two things. One that's been very frequently noted, and that is that Jabberwocky is English. It's very clearly English. You can get a fair amount of meaning from it, none of which avails itself of, of uh, conceptual vocabulary because the first stanza has no recognizable conceptual vocabulary, but you can still, you know, you can you use the structure, you use uh, the meaning of the functional items and so on. And that's, it's, it's grammar and it's English. But there is the flip side, and that is take Jabberwocky and eliminate the nonsense words. What does it matter? They don't mean anything anyway, but that's not language. So that means that, that those slots have to be populated. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be populated by meaningful things. They have to be populated by sound. Why that is, it's an interesting question. I don't really uh, have a... a, a an empirical answer to, to why, why uh, 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 conceptual items need to be phonologically realized uh, as opposed to being nonsense. So even if they don't have meaning, but, but this suggests to me that there is a certain, uh, there's a certain set of properties that are associated with uh, conceptual vocabulary, which is really quite different from the set of properties that are associated with items of formal semantics. So formal semantics doesn't trade in conceptual meaning. And I actually, I, in my own work, I have split the so-called conceptual intentional uh, interface, so-called, which most people assume is at the end of LF. And I'm saying, no, there's actually, um, there is LF, there is the meaning that comes from LF and that's formal semantic representation. And that formal semantic representation doesn't care whether you said something like every boy kissed a girl or you said every girl kissed a boy, okay? That, that, that doesn't, doesn't mm -hmm. care really. And then there's the meaning of boy and girl and the meaning of boy and girl does not live there. And I think the meaning of boy and girl is also in terms of its accessibility, its retrieval for us as speakers of natural language is mediated through the sound. So that's, um, that's a part of my work that is, um, I would say less acceptable, though to me, the, the arguments, not only are the arguments to me quite compelling, but I also think this is really the, in some sense, that's the historical position, because um, uh, when you look even at lexicalist accounts, the, 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 uh, the, the, what a word is, it's not dependent on its logical properties. It's, it's really a sound meaning relation, a pure sound meaning relation. So, yeah, I don't, yeah, okay. Um, so we'll move on a bit to the, um, uh, the Borea Chomsky conjecture. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, what, what is it? And um, if what, what do you think its status is 
Um, okay, I no. kind of already mentioned this. So, so uh, this is an idea that I had in 1980. Uh, this 1980 was the era of uh, uh, principles and parameters had just become a very dominant way of looking at language variation. You also, I mean, to some extent, it's not surprising that uh, generative grammar started in the United States and uh, for uh, for several decades, really, it was concerned with English and and uh, the. Properties of English are still written very writ large, you might say, over all the the, the properties of our grammatical systems in in a way that um, is really quite interesting because English is, the syntax of English is quite exotic. I mean, it's also I mean English is a is an easy learn language to learn because it doesn't have inflection. But when you think about some aspects of the grammar of English. Uh, they're quite exotic. I mean, do support all of these things, but but uh, uh, the whole structure of the auxiliary system, and and so that's um, uh, that that's very much it's been very influential in terms of the development of our grammatical uh, uh, modeling, and uh, other languages came into the picture gradually. They started percolating in from the late seventies onwards, and 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 it started becoming a very important aspect, which now is of course huge. And that is that that we really need to um, put our money where our mouth is. If we say this is universal grammar, then you have to go out there and show that this actually works for other languages. And uh, the, the 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 initial uh, uh, principled approach to this, which is, is still in, in very large stroke, is the one that people assume is the principles and parameters uh, system, whereby UG consists of a number of things which are invariant. And uh, then it also consists of a number of junctures where you might say an option is possible. So, and, 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 and language variation consists of particular languages uh, taking a, a different uh, a choice at some given uh, predetermined junctures. Um, the, the particular way that this was executed in the 80s, and, and, and this was a very exciting idea. I don't want to put it down. I think the agenda in the end we know was not the right one, but it was a very exciting idea. And that was the idea that you can, you, you only need to tweak one or two little things and they would have very far reaching ramifications all over the grammar. So if you look, for instance, at uh, Luigi Ricci's really important work uh, on binding, mm -hmm. on bounding nodes, and then on the pro drop parameter, uh, uh, you can see that the idea was that you have a very small thing, you know, like uh, uh, some relationship between the verb and the subject, for instance, and that would govern not just the relationship between the verb and the subject in, in, in some regular uh, uh, um, merry walk outside sort of sentence, but in all sorts of other contexts. And the idea was very exciting. And uh, it, it, it took a while before it became clear that, that the clustering is not, uh, doesn't hold. So even if it holds in one particular language in the next language, you find that there's no clustering. and so. Uh, um, but at any rate, in 1980, uh, I, in my own attempts to, to basically come up with a dissertation topic, really, I, I, uh, I thought about this and it occurred to me that, uh, that there's another way of doing it. And that is that where language variation wouldn't come from big parameters, but it would come from um, relatively small, small, uh, 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 properties associated with functional items. Now, at the time, the vocabulary wasn't even there. We didn't really have much vocabulary, much functional structure. Uh, and and the, the main thing I was uh, I was guided by, I, I was looking at some click doubling constructions in, 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 in uh, Romance and in Semitic languages, but also I was thinking about, for instance, cases like in English, the fact that in English you can get an, a, a subject that in infinitival, if you have a complementizer, it happens to be a case assigner. So you have something like, uh, I hope for John to get the job or something like that. And, and it occurred to me that, that, that it's not a big difference from that to a language such as mine or, or, or the other European languages that people were talking about at the time where this was not possible. But this is not a big a big parameter. You don't want a big structural thing uh, giving you the difference. All you want to say is that the functional vocabulary of English includes a complementizer that can assign case. End of story. You don't have to say an awful lot more. But if you take this to be 
true in this particular case, then it raises the possibility that across the board, all things which are language variation are contingent on properties of functors. So functors, uh, if we do it, accept that they have properties, that the syntactic properties, then they can have properties. They assign case, they don't assign case, they, they're transitive, they're intransitive, they are uh, distributive, they're whatever. They have whatever set of properties functions can have depending on, uh, on their position within the sentence. And, and, and this was, uh, I mean, I would say functional structure started taking off uh, really kind of following uh, uh, Pollock's work in the, in the late 80s, but, but, uh, but uh, it, it was kind of coming into being. And so I proposed that. I said uh, uh, parameters really are properties of the functional vocabulary of what I called what following a lot of traditional work, I called grammatical formatives. Mm -hmm. And so specifically not it's not uh, whether or not uh, kick is transitive and walk is not, but, but, but whether or not there is some kind of a, a formal element with some properties uh, that, that, that can vary from one language to the next. And so the idea at some point, um, I, uh, I mean, at some point, uh, Chomsky at the time, at the time I was sort of alone. It wasn't really, the idea was not really picked up by too many people, but, but it, it got picked up more or less in the 90s. And uh, at which point, I guess, Baker maybe um, dubbed it the Boyle-Chomsky hypothesis. But, uh, 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 and, and it became, I would say, the, 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 the very much the, the mainstream hypothesis today, so certainly within minimalism. And I certainly think it's still true. But, um, but, but it's also the case that when you look at how we do syntax today, the idea is true, but it's also trivial. And the reason that it's trivial is not because in principle, it's not a good idea, but because we do not have an agreed upon uh, inventory of features. And uh, we do not have an agreed upon principle of, of, of uh, how these features translate into a particular set of junctures in which you could make a choice. So uh, yes, you can, state, you, you can state that all parameters come from properties of functional items, but then you know, if, if I can just put in a new functional item anywhere at all and, and say, this is what guides these properties, then this becomes, um, this uh, sort of loses on, on, on its ability to explain anything because at this point it's not sufficiently constrained. Uh, and that I would say actually, if I may, uh, within minimalism, that's been a problem. That's not a new problem. That's a problem from the beginning of minimalism. And that is that even though minimalism has been around for 30 years in various guises, uh, um, minimalism is extremely feature driven. But, but there, there is no consensus on, uh, on what the features are or, um, or, or I mean, I'm, I'm not saying there aren't people who, who made proposals. There are some very uh, interesting proposals out there, but there isn't a single body of work that people appeal to in a systematic way when it comes to features. And so that means that, uh, 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 it, it becomes an assumption. So, so you know, you, 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 you read a piece of syntax and it says, okay, I'm assuming the following features and somebody else, I mean, there, there's, there's a core, core set of features that everybody assumes, but beyond that, what you see is, um, um, is, is a lot of variability. Uh, that's different from, uh, from in principle variability. So if you look, for instance, at nano syntax and, and how much, uh, composition they allow. So how much, uh, 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 whether they allow, for instance, a combination of features to project as a single head or not, that's a separate question. Uh, so, so that's, I'm separating this question, which is a question of take a given inventory of features, how do you translate it into a syntactic structure? That's an important question, but that's not the question where I think minimalism is, um, is in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, even, for instance, the success of the nanosyntax agenda uh, is difficult to evaluate if the next 
uh, model over, which is not nanosyntax, is assuming to begin with is a different set of features. And so, I mean, the question of whether, I mean, given a, a, a set of features, you know, n, n features, you know, n, n plus one features, whatever, uh, 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 you can start talking about how, how you translate them into representation and whether you cluster them or not. And, and maybe you can make an empirical argument. But if you're not agreeing on what the basic features are, it's, it's very difficult to, to evaluate the, the relative contribution of things. I, I, I would say it's, it's an outstanding problem. Mm -hmm. and it's, um, I hope it gets resolved. I personally don't work on it anymore. So I'm not really uh, hugely interested in, in investing and in finding what the set of features is. I'm happy to kind of look at what people have proposed and see whether it appeals to me or not, but, but yeah. Um, so what does this mean for language acquisition? Is it that the child is basically just learning um, if, if there's various languages involved, just learning uh, features of lexical items? No, I, I, I think that, okay, so let's assume that we do have a limited set of functional features, mm -hmm. whatever they are, that UG makes available 50 functional features, okay? And let's also assume that uh, uh, language variation, uh, uh, okay, uh, in, in, in my later work, to the extent that I return to this issue, I, I also proposed, and that's also been proposed, it's not just me, that uh, uh, it would also be good if we, if we uh, managed to come up with a model where the, 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 the interlanguage variation relative to features that we find is not relative to whether the features are there or not, but relative to how they're realized. Okay, so the, the child is, the child, we have to assume, I mean, that's what's left. We have to assume that the child is not starting from nothing. So the child is bringing to the task a certain inventory of features, okay? And the child in some sense, uh, uh, this is my assumption, uh, the child is building a structure uh, as based on these features and uh, uh, for all, I mean, my assumption is, and that's, um, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm mentioning Janet Fodor because she just spoke about this at, at uh, Queen Mary, and I, for instance, that's not her assumption. Uh, so a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people assume language acquisition is incremental. So mm -hmm. the child starts with a smaller structure and, and then builds a bigger and bigger structure. Uh, and I think that's, pretty much not true. I think the child may start with a small structure in the sense that the child is not gonna build the seven embeddings, but it's not, uh, it's not that the child is missing functional structure. It's that the child doesn't know how to populate that, um, that functional structure. So uh, uh, that's the kind of the Jabberwocky point that, that uh, conceptual stuff has to have phonology but um, functional stuff doesn't. I mean, we, we look all over and we have uh, a lot of empty elements and, and we know that they, I mean, the, the verb put in English does not, the past tense is not pronounced. It's not, uh, I mean, the, the, the existence of unpronounced functional items is, is pretty self-evident. So, so the child basically is looking at a structure, uh, which I think is fundamentally maybe a simpler structure, but that's because if you don't know how to pronounce it, you're gonna be pretty conservative. And, and the child pronounces what, uh, A, what the child, uh, uh, um, uh, what you have to pronounce. You have to pronounce things with, with lexical content. And secondly, uh, the child pronounces what is minimal, uh, minimally needed for some, some measure of communication to take place. Because uh, as we all know, if I, walk to you in a country where I don't speak the language and I'm looking at a little uh, word book and I say what are hungry you will probably understand what I meant even though there's no syntax to it whatsoever so that the, the child is optimizing uh, uh, communication but I have no particular reason to think and 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 I mean uh, there are studies of this but we are a little bit limited because at you cannot run an experiment on a two-year-old. And when an experiment, when a two-year-old says, mommy, shoot, I mean, you can only speculate. 
on whether that's just a random list of two words or whether there's a structure and what the structure is. So uh, my belief is that there's a lot more structure there than people assume. That uh, if there was no structure there, we would, this, we, would uh, and we would expect a lot more errors of a type that we never get. Uh, if the child is really just um, uh, trying to build structure on the basis of input. Um, I mean, the past tense of English is a very good example. So, so uh, um, in the 300 uh, most common verbs of English, 190 have an irregular past tense. So it is still true that what the child is exposed to statistically, there's a bulge. So 40% is uh, more or less is, is regular. And there isn't any other cluster of, of properties. So you're looking at a lot of noise, 40%, a lot of noise, yes. But it's still also the case that the child hears a lot of exceptions. And, and, and so eventually the child converges on the fact that, okay, the only significant statistical generalization here is, you know, ED or whatever, T or whatever, whatever it is that the is the quote unquote default past tense of English. Uh, but the child, I think, can only accomplish this task because the child is looking for a past tense. Mm -hmm. If the child is not looking for past tense and is just trying to reach the conclusion that there is past tense in marking in English on the basis of the distribution, uh, and given the fact that, that the child is not given paradigms, it's not like you give the child uh, paradigms of 300 verbs and say, okay, look, what's the generalization? No, because every verb is added in a unique situation, expresses whatever it is that it expresses. The ED could be marking the past tense marker. I mean, dive dope. Maybe it's marking past tense. Maybe it's marking the fact that mommy did it as opposed to daddy. Maybe it's marking the the fact that you did it wearing goggles as opposed to something else. Mm -hmm. The set of possible semantically meaningful, semantic in the loose sense, uh, uh, meaningful generalizations you can build into any given situation is infinite, okay? And some of them are very significant. I mean, the difference between red and blue is very significant, okay? It's contentful in a very obvious way. If I say you're wearing a red sweater, then you would think uh, that I'm either colorblind or that I'm lying, you know, whatever. But so, so there is uh, the, 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 the truth conditions of the statement uh, you're wearing a red sweater or blue sweater is very, very self-evident, but the child is not coming up with errors that, that indicate that they are looking to, to mark the difference between blue and red. And, and, uh, uh, and so the child comes up with the generalizations that they do on the basis of such partial data only because the child is having a targeted look. But if you're having a targeted look for a past tense, that means you have past tense. You cannot say the child is looking for something that the child doesn't know exists, okay? So, so that means the child already has past tense. He's already, he says, okay, fine, there's past tense. The past tense is uh, somewhere in the structure. UG tells me more or less. Uh, is it pronounced? How is it pronounced? You know, so then I'm looking around and then, and then I will notice that there is a subregularity. So is, is this the sort of hypothesis testing um, a, a no, approach? No, it's not. It's not the hypothesis testing. Oh, okay. It's the hypothesis testing approach in the sense that I'm testing the hypothesis of what would or wouldn't be the past tense realization of English, but it's not, a, a, yeah. I'm not building different structures. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if anything, I actually think, uh, I mean, it's, it's difficult because that's not how we've been thinking about acquisition when, when it comes to the question of um, uh, negative evidence. And so the, the focus on negative evidence, which is important, uh, has led to theories that are incremental because the negative evidence, the logic of negative evidence uh, has to be from the bottom up. If you overgeneralize, uh, negative evidence will, will never directly tell you you're wrong. Okay. But I actually, I mean, I, I don't, I can't tell you because, because I, I have some thoughts, but they're not sufficiently confirmed how that could be modeled. But I think that that actually um, uh, language progresses from subset to subset. So the child starts assuming that a lot of stuff is possible, which is not.
and, yeah. uh, and that that gets, gets whittled down possibly through converging on particular uh, um, uh, functional inventory with the limited features. I mean, in phonology, we know that is the case. So if you're looking at a kid that's exposed to Japanese, uh, Japanese adults, it's not just that the language doesn't have a distinction between R and L, uh, Japanese adults don't even always hear it. So, so they, 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 they're very likely to, for instance, when they speak another language confused between R and L, it's not, it doesn't look like they have a, mental, a mentally distinct representation between R and L. Mm -hmm. But bubbling babies do. And we know that because you have perception, perception experiments that, that kids who are eventually going to grow up to speak Japanese, they, they know the RL distinction and, 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 and it atrophies or something. Right. So, uh, so at least in phonology, we do know it goes from the superset to the subset. And I think that at least in, to my view, there's every reason to think that that, that is true for syntax as well. But I will be the first to admit that I have not fully worked out the logic of how the, what the relationship is between the input and the process of whittling down the set of possibilities other than what I just mentioned, maybe that I think that the child has an awful lot of quote unquote, no, no functional structure there that, that she's looking to, to populate. Mm -hmm. Um, and just to return to morphosyntax proper again, um, what what are endo and exoskeleton uh, skeletal explanations, and what's the difference? Okay, that's a little bit what what I I've already said. So so uh, uh, what what I refer to, I mean, uh, um, uh, endoskeletal. I mean, when I used the term, the term was actually the term exoskeletal was suggested to me by. Uh, by Henry Davis, uh, who actually was kind of mocking me. He says, you have an exoskeletal theory. I said, yeah, yeah, I do, thanks. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that, the, uh, the, it's a metaphor, uh, but, but I mean, the idea is whether you, uh, uh, and the idea is, the, 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 the metaphor is, is, is uh, refers to the particular role of, of lexical items. And so in the, uh, uh, but I mean, my system is partially endoskeletal in, in the sense that it does appeal to the properties of functional items. But, but when I first floated the term, endoskeletal explanations were, uh, were explanations where the, the um, uh, lexical items, lexical substantive items, like, like verbs in particular, were, were, were uh, 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 at the time, the idea was that they have a certain semantics and that lexical semantics informs the set of syntactic properties that they have. And then you, you build the syntax around them. So you can think about this as, 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 a, as, a, as a skeleton, as, as, a, as a, some kind of an internal uh, uh, um, uh, uh, structure around which you build the flash of the syntax. So, so that if you think about the syntax as, as a body, and, and the question is how you structure that body. So, so you look at an animal that has, has a skeleton and, and the skeleton is on the inside and you build uh, something around it. it, it uh, please do remember these are all metaphors, okay? Uh, and so you, you, you're flashing out, so to speak, the, the, the set of properties that are associated with the, with the lexical item and with the lexical item very crucially being conceived of as a, as a as a, a syntactic fragment with some underdetermined properties. Uh, the exoskeletal uh, uh, metaphor comes at it from the outside and it looks at the, 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 the starting point for the metaphor are animals that have uh, an outside structure that determines, the, that, that delimits the overall shape. So, so the idea was really, I mean, it was all relative to, uh, let's say argument structure. So if you look at uh, something like, uh, uh, it's an example that I cite a lot that's originally from Clark and Clark, the example for siren. So if you look at siren, which is a noun in English, but exists as a, as a denominal verb, and as they cite, it exists as a denominal verb in a lot of very different contexts. So, so if you take something like one of their examples, which is the police car siren up to the accident site, uh, so look at siren and siren, yes, it has a meaning because that sentence will only be true if there was a sirening noise somewhere, okay. But 
uh, the meaning of the sentence does not come from the sirening noise. The meaning of the sentence comes from the syntax of it. And the syntax of it is identical to what would be more canonically. So the, the police car uh, uh, hurried up to the accident site or something like that. And so you, you, you're giving it a syntactic structure, okay? And when you look at what, if you wanted to break it down, if it was important to say what siren means in the sentence, though I think, it's perhaps an unsensical question because maybe siren just doesn't have more meaning than, 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 than the noise. Uh, 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 what siren in this particular case would be associated with is not just um, the noise, but also some kind of motion and some arguments and so on. But this was all constructed from the outside. It was the syntax. So that's the endoskeleton versus exoskeletal um, metaphor really and it's uh, it's relative to, to 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 substantive vocabulary and 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 it says that really the meaning of substantive vocabulary to the extent that we perceive it to have a meaning uh, comes from the syntactic context it, it's delimited by the syntactic context it's not mm -hmm. it's not zero but it's delimited by the syntactic context and uh, and not the other way around so that's the metaphor, yeah. What, what would that mean for things like the projection principle? Uh, well, I mean, I think the projection principle is, 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 is neutral because it, what is the projection principle? The projection principle tells you that there are certain kind of argument uh, uh, relative to argument structure. So there are ways okay. of representing argument structure and uh, that once you have them, you, you're sort of stuck with them. Okay, you can't modify them as you mm -hmm. go along. Uh, and uh, although now we do know that they're probably built incrementally because if we assume merge, then they're built incrementally. Yeah. But uh, uh, so now there are two questions. You can say the projection principle uh, is something that's stated on the properties of particular lexical items. So you can say something which is Utah. So Utah says, okay, kick has, uh, an, I mean, Kick has an agent and a patient, let's say, okay. And, and so that means that in every level of representation, uh, Kick will have an agent and a patient. You can't get rid of them. And, 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 and if it looks, let's say in passive, like you got rid of one of them, you haven't really, you've, you've modified it in some way, you have an implicit argument and so on. So, um, so let's, let, let's look at the statement as it would be if we didn't, the attributed to kick. And so we would say, okay, there's a certain number of argument structured templates. Okay, some people nowadays, for instance, associate them as voice. I don't, but it doesn't matter. They're templates, okay. The templates say, you know, you build a structure that the argument that sits in position X is interpreted, if you wish, as patient, and the argument that's sitting in position Y is interpreted as agent, just to, to the sake of this discussion. And this is the template. And, and you can't change that. If you wanted to change that, you have to have some kind of an operation in place that would be transparent, that would be recoverable like passive and so on. And it has little to do with this kick because what kick would do or any other kind of verb is you would plug it into the structure and, and it would just assume the shape of the structure that's around it relative to its own role and, and uh, overall, but but uh, but the, the projection principle, uh, to the extent that we want to subscribe to some version of it, is is not doesn't need to be stated relative to the properties of lexical items. They can it can just be stated relative. To, certainly, if people think that the, all the argument structure comes from voice, you can state it relative to the properties of voice. Or if you think it's not voice, you can state it relative to whatever templatic structure you, you, you have that's associated with argument structure and the extent to which um, the syntax can or cannot modify it. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's it. Um, okay. Thanks very much for um, joining us here. It's been tremendously interesting. Um, I hope you, you enjoyed uh, it too.